first phase, come and see. And we're going we're gonna to look tonight at how Jesus taught them about one of the greatest enemies. We'll develop that in a moment. If you, John 2, 13 to 22. I uh, hope you have your Bibles with you. But if you don't have a Bible for some reason, uh, it's on the screens for you. Just stand with me if you wouldn't. Just follow along as I read. We talked about this this morning. This is coming up in Mark. So I thought it was really interesting and, a, and an interesting providence. I'm not smart enough to make this happen at the same time, folks. But, but an interesting providence of God that we would study about this tonight. This first cleansing of the temple before in a week or two, a couple of weeks out, we look at the second cleansing of the temple. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and in the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple. How will you raise it up in three days? John's commentary on this is, but he was speaking about the temple of his body. John didn't know that at the time. He writes reflecting back, understanding that. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. Let us recognize tonight the enemy so that we don't fall victim to him. And we'll talk about that a little more. Thank you. Be seated. They've just come from a wedding where Jesus performed a miracle. We talked about what he was showing them there. And now they come to Jerusalem. He's going to teach them that they're to be followers of their master, their rabbi, and make followers of Jesus, not set up schools of John or schools of Peter or schools of James. The whole purpose of him calling them was to produce followers of Jesus. They see him showing much mercy at the wedding. They see him showing a righteous wrath in the temple. It's interesting, one writer has said, you observe that when he met the woman at the well with her history of immorality, the woman caught in the act of adultery, thrown at his feet. Nicodemus, who would come to him at night with a certain amount of hypocrisy about him in, in the next chapter of John, that in none of these situations did he express a holy anger. But in this one he did. And I want to remind you this evening before we unpack this, what we've said about a disciple. There's five things. First of all, a disciple submits to a leader who teaches him to follow Jesus. A disciple submits to a leader who's teaching him to follow Jesus. That's a tough one to swallow for some people. Some people don't want to have that humility and submit and say, yeah, I need to be taught. But I'm here to tell you, if one of you wants to step forward and say, Pastor, I want to teach you how to follow Jesus better, I am your student. You understand me? I'm your student. Because I want to know him thoroughly, intimately, increasingly, and be more like him. Second thing is a disciple learns Jesus' words. 
That's why we go to the scriptures. That's why we take time in, in, in our Bible study times, in the morning worship, in the evening times, life group time, whatever. We take time to look and gaze into the word because, because Jesus' words, these ancient words, stand true. And the question we should be asking ourselves and one another is, am I learning? In other words, I don't, I don't want to live. Brothers, I don't want to live to see the morning dawn that I stopped learning. I want to die that night. But when we ask, am I learning, we need to understand that the definition of learning, particularly as it pertains to Jesus' words, is to live them. To live them. Salvation is by grace, which is unmerited, through faith, which is a gift, and not of ourselves. The root of that, that's the root of salvation. The fruit of salvation is a life of behavioral change. Paul describes it as a going from one stage of glory to another stage of glory, from uh, to increasingly conform to the image of Christ. We need to be honest and ask ourselves, am I growing more like Jesus? Third, a disciple learns Jesus' way of doing ministry. We don't try to get creative. Someone said methods, methods are many, principles are true. Methods may change, principles never do. Uh, we want to learn Jesus' way of doing ministry and then implement it in our setting, in our circumstances, in our culture. You could say when you watch the disciples and you read through the Gospels that this life Jesus lived before his followers was contagious. I have to ask myself and I ask you, is the life of Jesus contagious to you? They caught it. We need to learn and pray and see birthed in our lives increasingly these dimensions of Jesus' life, this, the exercising his authority and power, developing his character, and using his techniques of disciple-making. Fourth, a disciple imitates Jesus' life and character. You know, there's a big movement years ago, and I think it had some merit to it. it, it for a lot of kids wore wristbands and even some adults, what would Jesus do, WWJD? I think that's good. But really the question is, what did Jesus do? It's, it, 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 it was asked in such a way as we would go, now, what? Well, no, we have the scriptures that tell us what he did. We should go to the scriptures, appeal to the scriptures to find out how would Jesus have us to act? How, what would he have us to say and do in this situation? He imitates, a disciple imitates the life and character of Jesus. One writer said this, and it's just when, when, he, when I read it, I went, oh. We have found too many ways to be Christians without being Christ-like. Think about everything that passes for Christian in this culture. I told you we have two people in opposite parties who are running for the office of president, and they're the, they're the front runners right now. One who says, I never needed to repent of anything. The other said, I've never lied. Yet they, they imagine themselves to be wonderful Christians. When we become disciples of Jesus Christ, we join a new order of life. It's a life of personal discipline and, and personal accountability to others. And that word accountability is, boy, that's a, you want a, a hot button term today? And that, that's exactly what we need. We need, we need small, groups of two to three people loving one another, holding one another accountable, praying for one another, reading with one another the scriptures, letting the truth wash over us. Because that's how you're transformed into the image of Christ. Fifth, a disciple finds and teaches disciples to follow Jesus. That's what a disciple does. And my prayer is that all of us will be better 
disciple makers, having just having come here to wrestle with this and let the text of the scriptures pin us down and not let us up until we say, okay, I give. I give. I see it. I give. Certainly, if this is the model, then it's got to be within the reach of every church. No, no church, no matter how small, no matter how large, can say, well, we don't, we don't have enough fill in the blank, or we have too much fill in the blank, or we're too far beyond. To, to take this simple disciple-making principle and practice. And where we are right now is come see. Come and see. It's that simple, and, and I want to keep pressing that to you. I want to keep hearing your stories. I want you to provoke one another to love and good works, to provoke one another to jealousy, to, to look for opportunities and say this week to somebody, someone you've known most of your life, somebody you've just met, come and see. Come, come go to church with me. There's a book written years ago, When All Else Fails, Read the Instructions. And I think that that's kind of the time that has come to the church in the West now. To go back and read the instructions. Say, Lord, the question Saul of Tarsus asked when he was smitten from his, from his ride on the road to Damascus and discovered who it was that was dealing with him and what the accusation was that he leveled at Saul. And his answer was, Lord, what would you have me to do? That's got to be our question. Lord, what would you have me to do? You say, Pastor, I've been, I've been a Christian for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Wonderful, thank God. Never grow beyond asking the question, Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, what would you have me to do? When we stop asking that question, we stop. We take ourselves out of the flow of the real excitement of following Jesus. I came across this. And boy, this rebuked me because here I'm, I'm doing something here and, and someone said, I hear, I forget. Well, that's real encouraging to me, of course, to know that it's been 30, 45 minutes. I hear, I forget. I see, I remember. So I'm hopeful and prayerful that the screens bring a visual to the hearing. But then I do I understand. And I, again, I go back and I think part of the reason that, we, that the church is so anemic in the area of disciple making is that we've heard about it. There's, you, we could take turns and you could come up here and take this platform and teach on discipleship. And we've even seen models of it, read about it, but it's the doing. I do, I understand it. And if you're a teacher here tonight, you teach in Bible study, you've taught in other, you know this to be true. You, when you finally come to teach whatever you've prepared to teach, you are the, you're the chief benefactor of that. It was the study of that. It was the, the wrestling with that. It is the communication of that that makes it yours. So I want us to keep that in mind. I hear I forget. We'll try to challenge that. I see, I remember. We're going to bring that aid along. I do, I understand. I hope that we're all here ready to do, willing to do, because that's when you'll understand discipleship. And it won't be a theory, and it won't be a concept, and it won't be an idea. It won't be something somebody else does. It will be for us. Now, let's look at this text for a few minutes here. I want you to know up front we have a threefold enemy. You've heard this taught and preached, I'm sure, many of you. We have a threefold, an, an unholy trinity, if it, if it were. The world, so that we're taught in 1 John 2, not to, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in that person. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, which, by the way, those three things correspond to Eve standing in the garden when she saw that the fruit was pleasant. She realized it was good to be eaten and able to make one wise. 
All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, it is of the world. And the world is passing away, John says in 1 John 2. And the things of the world are passing away with it. And, but he who is practicing the will of God. So let's just, let's, he who is intentionally engaging in being a disciple maker abides forever. The world is our enemy. Now that, when we say that, that doesn't mean that we then take up the weapons of the world. Because Paul said in, Corinth, in the Corinthians, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty. We don't fight the way the world fights. We don't, as the bumper sticker says, we don't, you know, I don't get mad, I get even. We don't get even. But the world is not our friend. We need to teach our children that. We need to live that before them. Well, it's the world, the flesh, that remaining sin within us. When we're saved by grace through faith, we're delivered from the dominion of sin, but not the condition of sin. And Paul wrestles with that in Romans 7. Remember when he says, the things that I know I should be doing, I find myself not doing. The things I know that I should not do, I find myself doing. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this stinking, decaying flesh that I'm carrying, this corpse I'm carrying around on my back? It's no, it's no longer I that's doing it. It's sin dwelling in me, the indwelling sin of the believer. The flesh. Those opportunities we have to make choices. Will I choose righteousness? Or will I choose sin? We make choices like that every day, multitudes of times a day. Will I choose the, on this situation the path that is following Jesus and honoring God? Or will I choose to let my emotions be known, to let my expression, you're going to get a piece of my mind. You know, where, where are we going to? We choose every day. Isn't it interesting? When we were unconverted, the only choices we could make were bad choices. Even our best choice was what the Puritans would call glorious sin. When we're converted, though, saved by grace through faith, something is restored in us so that, so that we now have the capacity to choose good or choose evil. John says in 1 John, if we've been born again, we will not keep on choosing evil. That will not be the habitual pattern of our lives. But we do face that temptation. The flesh. And then the devil. And here's what I think happens. Either we live as if there is no devil, or we live as if the devil is, is all-powerful. And neither one of those is true, neither one of those is healthy. There is a devil. Jesus taught more about hell than he taught about heaven. Check it out in the Gospels. But the devil is not all-powerful. He's God's devil on God's leash. Here's what I think we do. You know, and Flip Wilson years ago made this famous, the devil made me do it. Now, and what that does is that absolves the person of any responsibility. Let me tell you where the enemy is. The, if we fought this one enemy, if we put to death the deeds of the flesh, the world would not have the sway with us that it often has, and the devil would not find a foothold. But when we ignore the battle with the flesh, which is the main battle, we open ourselves up to the, to the, the sirens of the world. Come. Pleasure. It's not wrong. It's understandable. You're an exception to the rule. Are the devil's accusations. And so my challenge as I challenge myself and I challenge you, is to do battle with the flesh. Recognize it for what it is. That impulse that we still have, it's the condition of sin that still remains. One day, the glory of heaven, think about the movement now, just real quickly. I've taught you this before, but just to remind you. In the garden, in Adam and Eve's condition, as they were created before they fell, <clears throat> they were made upright, 
and they were, they were capable of choosing good or evil. When they chose evil, when they sinned against God, then they were only capable of choosing evil. That's what the fall does. It corrupts your, your will, corrupts your mind, corrupts your, your affections. When they're restored, saved by grace through faith, there is the capacity to choose good or evil brought back. And when we're taken to heaven, guess what? This is freedom, bro. In heaven will only be able to choose good. There'll be no evil options. And that's true freedom. When the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. When He sets you free from your bondage of sin where you can only choose evil, and He sets you free uh, unto His righteousness where you now can choose good and evil, and is taking you to heaven where you will only be able to choose good, that is true freedom. We need to redefine that, don't we? Because what's the, what's the cultural definition of freedom today? Having all the choices to do what I want to do. That's not freedom, that's bondage. Particularly when you make the wrong choices, then you're brought into bondage. So, with that little bit of background, look at John 2, 13 to 22. This is the first time that Jesus attends Passover in Jerusalem with these disciples that he has chosen. I told you this morning, I think at the end of his, his time on earth, when he was heading into Jerusalem in the triumphal entry, I believe that they were excited. I think there was an excitement here when they came into Jerusalem at Passover for the first time. Until. Until he walked in and gazed upon what had become of his father's house. A house of prayer for all the nations. When he says that, you ought to recognize that yes, the Jews were to pray for the nations in the, in the court of the Jews, but the whole Gentile court existed as tangible evidence that the Jews were praying for the nations. It was a place where they wanted Gentiles. And we talked about this this morning. They, they were supposed to invite them. Come and see. We pray for you. And that had been lost. And there he is. He gazes upon those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons. These are the various uh, sacrifices. And if he didn't have the right amount, they had the change collectors, the money exchangers who could take your shekels and turn them into something else. If there was a temple tax that was owed, they could help you get the right amount. Brothers and sisters, it was religion by convenience. And it's as if they had lost their purpose. They lost their purpose. The prophets had said God would make them a light to the Gentiles. God would make them a vast tree where the birds of the earth could come and nest and rest. And the Jewish leaders had manifested the example and taught the people to despise Gentiles, to despise Samaritans, and they turned that blessed part of the temple, the outer court, into a marketplace. Who cared about the Gentiles anyway? They weren't important. That was the attitude. Can we learn from this? They had become more concerned for themselves than for the lost, for those outside of Judaism. Everything had to be about them, their well-being, their comfort, their pleasantries. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could say, boy, I'm grateful that that was just a first century phenomenon. But it's not. 
It's not. You can trace the history of religion, and I, I don't want to do that full thing tonight, but you know, you know good and well how quickly, how quickly after the disciples were martyred and the, uh, the apostolic fathers that they were called, these were the apostolic fathers were the disciples of the disciples, which proves that the disciples were disciple makers. The apostolic fathers taught, and when they passed off the scene, the Roman church was gaining ascendancy. And all of the opulence and all of the chicanery and the trickery that convinced people that, that if they would give money, uh, they could help a loved one out of purgatory. And finally it reaches its zenith when Martin Luther, who himself was a Roman Catholic monk, sees it and is just repulsed by it and challenges it. And the gospel is recovered in the Reformation. Salvation by grace through faith, not salvation in the sacraments, not salvation by paying coin, not being made right with God. And I think the question we have to ask ourselves is, do we do this today, or how do we do this today? Now let me say quickly, this is not, when you get this image of the, of the court of the Gentiles being scourged by Jesus, this is not then to be concluded, well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have fundraisers, we shouldn't have things in our foyer promoting, as we did recently, the, uh, the, the snack attack, the collecting snacks. That's not what we're talking about here. Unless those things replace the heart of the ministry. The heart of the ministry is to love God and to love others, love one another and to serve the world, not, never as an end in itself, but to stoop and serve the world, that the world might be taken back, shocked that we would stoop to do that, that we wouldn't come to them wanting something from them, rather we came to them wanting to give them something, and as we serve the world that we would have an opening for the gospel. With Josh listening to that man yesterday, just listening. We've said this before, do you realize how many people around you have so few people who will listen to them? You don't learn it on the news. Count point, point, uh, counterpoint, point, counterpoint. You don't learn it on the news where they talk over one another, talk back to one another. Nobody's listening in the public arena. And here we come, and guess what? As the Puritan said, God gave us one mouth and two ears. Use them proportionately. Listen. Show concern. People increasingly are turned off by being a part of a church because they look upon churches and think they simply want me so that they can get to mine. More than ever, we're reading about lawsuits where people who came into one of these churches that made them a promise that could not be kept. You join us and you give and we promise you you'll get this kind of blessing. More and more lawsuits are being filed against churches. And I say... Good. We need to weed out this nonsense. We need to stop carrying on. I'm not talking about we personally, but we, the church in the West, need to stop carrying on as if, as if we are here to use people to get what they have. And it's happening all around us. Satan will not tempt us to turn our foyer into a cattle trough. Okay? Those days are gone. What would he tempt us to do, though? What was the principle he was using in that court of the Gentiles scenario when Jesus walked in and saw what he saw? It was overcome with a, with a white, hot, righteous anger. What did he tempt the people to do? I like what one writer said. I think he got it on the head here. He was transforming the mechanics of the ministry into the ministry itself. The things that a church needs, we, you know, we need. We need to collect tithes and offerings. We need to pay our bills. We need to keep the lights on. We need to keep the heat. When it, we need heat and air conditioning. When we need air conditioning. Those things are all good and, and beneficial. But if that becomes the most important thing in ministry, then we're missing the ministry. 
the mechanics of the ministry have, have supplanted and taken the place of that. And we could tell story after story. Of people, I, I've known of churches, you may have heard about them, that split when they had a discussion over what color the carpet, the new carpet ought to be. Had a church split. There's a church, I don't know if it still exists in Texas or not, but in West Texas at one time, there was a church out there that was discussing renovating, and a portion of the congregation wanted uh, theater seats. You know, the kind they fold up, and then you... You sit on them and they, they come down. The, the seats are permanent, but the, the seating area folded up. And a portion of them wanted pews. And it got very intense. And when the renovation was through, you would walk into that facility and see half the auditorium with theater seats and half with pews. And it stood as a testimony to the mechanics of the ministry becoming the ministry. And things like evangelism go by the wayside. Things like mercy go by the wayside. Things like engaging the community go by the wayside. It's subtle. And where you find it in modern day, I don't think it, I don't think it begins with intention. I've been in situations, you know, you pastor long enough, you get to see a lot of things. And I've been in situations where folks that would not come to go with us to, on outreach to visit and wouldn't come to pray and didn't come a whole lot to study the Bible took a sudden interest in the Constitution. They would call the church office, I need a copy of the Constitution. The mechanics of the ministry. You think, well, if you could harness that energy with prayer, if you could harness, harness that zeal, a consuming zeal for the lost, what would that look like? Jesus was angered then, and I think he is angered today. When he looks upon his church that bears his name, and he doesn't find a growing concern and commitment to move heaven and earth to become disciple makers who make disciple makers. And rather than being faithful, oftentimes the discussion degenerates into being right. And he would say to the contemporary church, just as he said standing in that outer court, get this out of here. My, ha my father's house should not be treated this way. And we're told that his disciples, when this happened, they remembered. They, they were good Jews. They'd been trained and raised. You know, family, family times, family worship times, family study times, devotion times, whatever you want to call them, uh, were in preponderance in the Jewish days. They would be familiar with Psalm 69, 9. It says, zeal for your house will consume me. They remembered that when they saw him acting like that in the temple. It made a connection. You see, Jesus was showing them what not to do and identifying his actions to Scripture that they already knew in the Old Testament. He calls us to do the same. Whether there are people who, who were raised in church, so to speak, who don't attend anymore to see in our lives, to hear from our lips things that trigger in their memories something they were taught. Or people who are a blank slate so that we can act in such a way and speak in such a way that they come to ask us, why is it, how is it that you have hope? The scripture tells us to always be ready to answer anyone who asks us for the reason, for the hope that we have in us. Why, does that, why do they ask that? What prompts them to ask that? They see it by our actions. They hear it in our words. And we can say, come and see. 
They challenged Jesus. Here they wanted to know who gave him the authority, who gave him the permission to do what he did. Where Show us a miracle. In other words, convince us that, that, that we shouldn't be angry at you for what you just did. You really spoiled initially, for the time being, at a very untimely situation when Passover is upon us, you spoil some, some pretty good cottage industry here. His answer was, destroy this temple, I'll raise it up again in three days. To show how dull their hearing is, they heard temple and thought building that he had just desecrated in their minds, although he was responding to those who had desecrated it. They appealed to the time it took to build the temple. Forty-six years this temple was in the building, this temple of Herod the Great. So they conclude, not that he's speaking about something that they may not be aware of, but they conclude that he's insane. He's a false rabbi, and also he's mentally unstable. And Jesus gives his followers at that point the opportunity to see how he will deal with the leaders of Israel. I said this morning, as you remember now, this morning we're standing on the, near the end of the ministry and looking back. Here in the evening, we're standing at the beginning of his ministry and looking forward. How would he relate to the religious leaders? And he begins to turn on its head their notions of how he would form a coalition. Sanhedrin would embrace Messiah, would promote him. The Jewish soldiers who were under the authority of the Sanhedrin would come as the military flank. The people would rise up. That was their thinking. In fact, you see it reflected in John the Baptist when he, when he has that moment of, of weakness and he, he says to those who have come to see him in prison, go ask the rabbi, is he the one to come or should we look for another? He was, he was not doubting that Jesus was Messiah. He was wondering, is this going to be one of those two-person messiahs? That is one of the theories going around. One would be a religious man. One would be a, a holy man. One would be a, a warrior. And they would come together to, to lead. Jesus shows them gives them a glimpse of what it's going to be like if you're going to follow Jesus Christ. And it's still a principle. If you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you are going to be challenged at every turn by religion. Remember, in the colonies, the days of the colonies, when our Baptist forefathers began to flex their muscles and, and have some advance, but they were persecuted by other denominations. In England, our Baptist forefathers were drowned by people who would say to them who were religious types, respectable people in their own respective denominations, who would say to them, well, if it's all about being dipped in water, then enjoy the plunge. And they would drown them. They would tie, bind, bind them with their ankles and their hands and throw them into the river to drown them. Done in the name of religion. There are a lot of things done in the name of religion today. A young man who's a fine young pastor, well-trained, well-read, devotional, godly, was removed by two churches because he preached the Scriptures. A friend of mine had a group of men call him into a circle, a room where there was a circle of chairs and his chair was in the middle. They invited him in. You know him. He's preached here before. And they called him by his name and said, we just want to tell you there are some problems with your preaching. And he said, how so? They said, well, you know, you can, you can catch more flies with sugar than you can with vinegar. He told me, he said, Bill, I don't know what came over me. But in a moment, I said, men, sugar is not the only thing that draws flies. And they dismissed him. It happens over and over again, folks. Religious people 
are doing so much harm. Just like the Sanhedrin was doing harm. And we have to check ourselves and say, now what drives me? Does being a follower of Jesus Christ conform to the image of, of His will to, to be more like Him, to, to engage people more like He would have me engage them? A couple more stories and I'm going to close. I was pastoring in another church many, many years ago. A church down the road. Dear people, they believed very much like we believed. They were not a Southern Baptist congregation, but they had a, a building that had no baptistry, and they had some folks that had been converted that they wanted to baptize into their fellowship and contacted me and said, we'd like to come on a Sunday afternoon before you have services and have a baptism service in your baptistry if we can do that. We'll, we'll pay for the water, we'll pay for the utilities, whatever. We just need a place to baptize someone. I talked with our deacons, I said, I think we ought to let them do it. And there was agreement there, so, so they did, they came. Well, some folks came in to the service, evening service early, to do something in the auditorium and saw the episode and came to me, a few ladies came to me during the week and said, who authorized that baptism? I said, well, I told them it was okay. They need a place to baptize. They're, they're Baptists. They believe and practice believers' baptism by immersion. Do you know who those people were? I said, yeah, I know the pastor and I know some people. Do you know what they believe? I said, yeah, I know what they believe. They have no business using our baptistry. That was the spirit. That was the missionary heart that manifested itself there. One more story. A young man came to a jeweler, told him, he said he wanted to learn all that he could learn about jade. He wanted to be an authority on jade, the stone. The man said, well, come back tomorrow and the lessons will begin. So the young man came back and came to his house and the jeweler said, here, and he had him hold a jade stone. He said, hold it. The little boy did that for a while. Time passed. Finally, the man said, give it back to me. And he sent him home. He had him do this over and over, day after day, week after week, into the months. And the young man finally was uh, growing impatient. And he said, when am I going to learn how to be an authority on Jade? The man said, come back tomorrow. So he came. The man handed him a stone. The young man felt it and dropped it immediately saying, this is not jade. And the man said, that's right. And he had taught him to recognize authentic jade by handling the real thing. The FBI does that. They teach their counterfeiters. One of the, the first men I served with in ministry had been a, a counterfeiter uh, intelligence for the FBI. Yeah, they train them to watch out for all the different nuances of counterfeit money coming down, but the one thing they do over and over, he said, they teach us we handle money so much, the real thing, that when it passes between our hands and it's not real, we recognize it. And brothers and sisters, that's how we should get plugged into Jesus Christ. So clearly the obvious things that would repulse him would not come on our screen, but it's the subtle things. It's the things we'll settle for that are something other than him. Knowing him, loving him, serving him, following him, being like him, to so if I can use the term, handle Jesus Christ, that we recognize the authentic and then we recognize that which is not authentic. We distinguish between biblical Christianity and Western churchianity. 
And though the two take place in buildings, they are nothing like each other. One is an abysmal counterfeit. The other is the genuine article. You know, my desire for you and for me, for all of our church really, is that we will so embrace what Jesus was teaching these followers that come and see. We'll be grateful that someone invited us. I told you my mother used to drag me kicking and screaming down the street to take me to church. Literally. To my shame, I say it. Someone invited us to come and see. And then we cannot help but do that with others that we encounter. Are you attending church? Where do you attend church? Would you like to come and join me at our services, at our studies? Just the simple invitation. It's going to get more intense, but it started out very simply. Come and see. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we look at this passage, we see the uh, holy anger of our Savior. And I pray that we would be gripped with a holy anger at, at any part of our flesh which wants to pursue that which is not the ministry and yet do it in the name of the ministry. Help us, Lord, to be focused. Help us to have a laser focus on Jesus, the disciple maker, so that we would become disciple makers. I thank you, Lord, for those who are here. I believe they're here because they have more than a passing interest in this. And I pray that, that it will turn into a passion and a flame and we will say and then do, we cannot help but engage in this. But then, Lord, at the same time, I, help us see the, the precious simplicity of Jesus' invitation, which was picked up by those early disciples who used the same invita invitation, come and see, and help us this week, because we will encounter people this week, Help us this week to say to those we encounter, come and see. Come and see. And, and then bless that, Lord. Bless that to encourage and, and provoke us to your pleasure upon such an endeavor. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.